Are you thinking about making a podcast? Spotify has a platform that lets you make one. And if I can figure it out, you definitely can too. You can create your own content all in one place for free with zero hangups and even earn money as soon as you get started. Spotify lets you record and edit episodes from your phone or computer so you can go mobile just like I enjoy to do. My favorite thing about it is that you can create video episodes if you wish and upload them to wherever podcasts are heard. You can even set up subscriptions or if you're like me, listen to support options for listeners to help you grow. I 10 out of 10 recommend the Spotify for Podcasters app. Or, you know, why don't you just step over to www.spotify.com slash podcasters to get started on your own podcast. Thank you so much for the support, the conversations that I've had recent with people that reach out to me, and the absolutely overwhelming um, amount of people sharing the messes that we have here to talk through trauma. If you like what we do here at Off the Deep End, please feel free to subscribe and gain special access to subscriber-only episodes or you can continue to do what all of you great people have been doing, just sharing the episode right after you finish it with the world. So we can share these conversations, not just with people that we know, but even people that we I might not know. I love when people reach out to me and we get to have in real time conversations about the things they're going through. I get phone calls, emails, uh, text messages, and a lot of just personal private messages from people who are going through things and I'm able to share some of the perspective that I learned from others. And slowly we can work towards the, the end goal of stopping at least one person a day from ending their own life, thinking that they can't talk to other people about their problems. Talking through trauma is the goal here at a, our, at our program here. And I really do appreciate everybody's endless support and all the different conversations we've had so far. So if you like what we're doing here and you'd love to support us, please do subscribe. All the way from Michigan. Thank you so much for joining me today, bud. Thank you, man. I really appreciate it. Yeah. So why don't you start with giving me some of your backstory, like your childhood, your upbringing, your situation with parents and all that. Uh, So I'm the baby of four. I got four. I got three other siblings. Uh, I got an older brother and then two older sisters. Um, Parents married throughout, you know, you know, I was grateful to have them both together uh, throughout my, you know, time and still they're still together. I think they're like celebrating close to like 30 years together, roughly. I wow, could be. that's amazing. I could be. Yeah, I, I usually I, I default back to 25 sometimes. Uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, so uh, growing up, like it started off poor. Because we were we were originally from Jersey. I'm originally from Jersey, Hudson County, New Jersey. Um, and to give an idea, that's like literally 15 minutes across from New York City, from either by tr- uh, bus, train, down the road, it became a ferry. Um, so, inner city kids, pretty much. Um, out of the four, we, I was the only one that was able to securely go through private school. I graduated from St. Augustine's parochial, and then I then graduated from St. Peter's preparatory. Um, and it's funny, ironically, and I'll dive into this later, but like having went to college and then uh, I'm 28 now. Um, parents live down in Georgia. I live in Michigan due to my naval career at the end and everything. Uh, brother lives in jersey still but he lives at least outside of where we live at so like he kind of moved out still in the same state but he, he moved out at least um sister number one the oldest she lives actually in michigan too but she's like an hour and a half away so it's not that far but it's still a drive out there and then my other sister she lives out in uh and actually in the city and everything so um and then i got a little one of myself very cool so you stay in the so you, you would say that your family was pretty close growing up? Initially, yeah. But as we grew up, we definitely grew apart. Um, and I think there was just primarily just the way it was strict. I mean, like we had a, you know, a Latina matriarch household type deal. 
mm-hmm. you know, whatever mama says was like the law. Okay. <laughs> Dad was very lenient, passive in a way sometimes, but like mom, whatever mom said was what had to be done and everything. Okay. Is that normal that you've experienced that without the, uh, throughout the community? So yes and no, I have seen other like within my background and growing up like I have had some of my friends that said that like their relationships with their parents were not as uh strict like I'll never forget this it was uh Dr. Dr. DiLorenzo my history teacher from from high school was telling me that I had a father like Patton and a mother like Stalin oh man and i remember some pretty serious I was, comparisons yeah because i was so sick i remember i was like like sick as a dog i had like a fever and i couldn't get an initial ride home and like my parent my dad was the only one who, who was was driving all of us essentially and like i didn't have money to catch the bus or the light rail and uh my dad like after i called dad and the nurse was like hey we need to like get him home like he like he's he has a fever he's like a hundred right now and he's coughing up phlegm and everything like he's sick he should not even have gotten to school and then my dad was like yo can you just try and tough it out so that like i got till i was like fuck it how are you gonna tell me to tough it out at 16 17 years old bro jesus (laughs) and i'm like barely i'm like barely able to like and it's not like i'm sleeping purposely sleeping in class my own body's like bro you just need to relax i'm like stop stop just trying to fight it the entire time okay so you had uh relatively strict parents who like this way or or, or no way at all kind of parents yeah as okay. long as you live in my house it's my rules so they That's... dealt in absolution i see yeah okay. now yeah like i don't know like yeah um but then like as i talk to my siblings there's been times where i like I guess they were, they eased up eventually at mm-hmm. some point, but like. But that was your that, initial, initial, like when you're living through it, that was your, your original observation. Yeah. I was in survival mode the entire okay. time. Oh man, favorite. for real? Yeah. As far as I can remember, as I'm going through like my therapy with my, my current therapist right now, like. There's there's a lot of like stuff that I had subconsciously dug into my brain in order to like just survive and like the mannerisms and behaviors that I exhibit now is strongly because of what I had to do in order to survive as the baby of four mm-hmm. with all the expectations on me. I see. So do you still have a good relationship with your parents or is it pretty strained? Oh man. So I guess it's, I want to say it's like 50, 50. It could be better. It is getting better. I, it's really all on me. When I left for the Navy at 19, you know, this is back in 2013, that was like my getaway. And it was a really, ideally it was me getting away from mom. Mom was really like my main issue. I guess you can say I have a mom wound, right? <laughs> right. Well, you know uh, what? Honestly, man, uh, every everybody has obviously different reasons for joining the military. I would say, from my experience so far, about eighty five percent, you know, relatively speaking. And I'm I'm talking about like every, I've asked everybody I I served with why they went to the military, and yeah. it's usually because I wanted to break something, uh, gen- like a generational trauma from my parents, and I don't yeah. want my kids to to feel that same way. Yeah. Do you um? So obviously you've rec- you through your therapy and through just living life and growing up and experiencing other life other than you know at being at home you've experienced mm-hmm. parents that are are strict and did any did any of your other sailors you served with have the same kind of situation going on? A little bit. The uh, a few of my other sailors that and some of my uh, buddies, I wouldn't say necessarily strict like. It'd be like like another thing of like fifty fifty two. Mm-hmm. Some would be saying that they were strict. Others say that they were lax. Others would be like, man, like it's been so long since I've been in my parents' crib. I'm like, all right, dude, like. 
Um, yeah, like I can't really pinpoint too much with like with my guys that I served with. I know when I went through basic for the army right now, um, it's a completely different generation. I'll tell you that they, mm -hmm. they, they, they don't really are, understand what strict parents can be. They don't know. No, they don't understand what strict parents is. Uh, if anything, some of them were very coddled by their parents. With so, with, the, like, with the helicopter parent style is what I usually is and like I know some parents can be pretty extreme. So on one side you have the helicopter parent who's always over your shoulder. Why? Mm -hmm. why, why wait a second. I don't want you to get a cut. Get on down. Don't don't get dirt on your knees or or anything like that. And not to you know blanket statement and say that parents are weak for that. Um, this is just yeah. what I've what I've observed in, in one extreme form. And then you have on, on another side of the scale, you have the parent that's like, oh, do whatever. It's all good. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah. I don't I don't <laughs> enjoy enjoy the, the 10 mile walk to school. You'll be fine. You'll be safe. <laughs> you don't need a cell phone to, to call me. I don't need to make sure you're okay. You know, it's completely <laughs> yeah. hands off. Yeah. <laughs> and and that hands off spectrum is usually tied into abuse or or certain things like that. I noticed that you talked about your parents, your mother being the matriarch and your father being uh, somewhat passive aggressive yeah. or, or sorry, not passive aggressive, but passive in the, in that relationship. Is it normal um, with people with your background or your ethnical background uh, to have experienced similar things or does it, does no, it vary? At least I, I can't, I can't say if it is normal or not. Uh, okay. I know like, the definition right like growing up of like being a man for the family and masculinity mm -hmm. right was like you work hard provide for the family make sure they have a food over their head i mean wow wow Blech. you have a roof over their head mm -hmm. <laughs> food on food on the plate a place to sit a place to sleep shower and clothe and then once you have all the necessities if you even got the extra dough, send them to private school and have them get their pri that private education and just like a okay, um, and yeah, like dad did work a lot, uh, but like it was mainly mom being the disciplinarian and everything, and she uh handled majority of the finances. So dad made the money essentially mom made money too um but like she handled everything for the most part she handled everything at home i should say that. okay so she so she she was kind of responsible for the nurturing of the children the disciplining of the children yeah um guiding them to, to understand what good and bad is and i know for me it was definitely difficult uh growing up having an improper balance so yeah it doesn't matter who who does the the nurturing and who does the disciplining but it, it is achievable for each parent to do some disciplining and some, some, um, some nurturing. And that is an even kill that some parents are able to work out, but that's, that mm -hmm. comes down to how you are in a relationship with your partner though, uh, because you're raising the next generation and it, it, yeah. it doesn't always end up with a healthy balance and it can always, it can sometimes result in a whole lot of discipline and not a lot of yep. nurturing. And that causes some significant issues in the self-confidence, the self-love, the, the love in general, how you have relationships with other human beings, because, when you're a child, all you know is to to mirror what your parents teach you or mm -hmm. rebel and revolt. But uh, usually what I've noticed is that there's a lot of people that like to follow that image. And that's, you know, that's that, that's where racism stems from. That's when a lot of time that's when great hearted people who want to do more for you than you even want to do for yourself, like really kind uh, community servants can come from as well. Um, yeah. So you seeing this strict, the strict upbringing with your with your with your mother and with your father who's working uh did you did you could you say that you have a healthy relationship with love uh no actually so and it may and i think it mainly just stems from uh the init like my initial upbringing and that mom wound mom mm -hmm. wasn't that like nurture nurture love that i needed as a that you would need that anybody would need as a child yeah i'm not saying 
I'm not saying that like she did a horrible job raising any of her kids. She did what she could with what she had, you know. Yeah, like, there's no book on it. Yeah, there's no book. There's no standard. Yeah. And and that's why I, I ask these questions, man. It's not to uh, just just so everybody and all the listeners know as well. It's not to to set a set a bar because I yeah, hate yeah, society's yeah. bars. I hate society's standards. I think it's yeah. ridiculous that you're we're all meant to meet this 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 role model. Uh, father figure was supposed to work and the mom is supposed to you know love and nurture the kids and the dad was the discipline when he gets home and you went to your dad gets home i think that's all garbage and nonsense everybody can uh achieve their own level of greatness based off of what they see within themselves and so yeah that uh so you ultimately ended up leaving for the military which is a huge thing and um uh i honestly thank you for your service every single person who signs up for the military to make sure that uh, our neighbors and me and, and and everybody else in the world isn't drafted or conscripted into the military like happens in other countries uh yeah. is, is a hero regardless of what they did you know i know people that move boxes and they're really down upon themselves uh and they, all they did that was that for their whole career uh and all four years and they didn't try to achieve any greatness or move change jobs they were just sad because they found out that that's what that would do their current career is and mm-hmm. i don't look at no one should look down on them they should not feel bad about themselves you still signed up so that my little sister didn't have to get drafted or my little brother didn't have to get drafted or yeah. this and that and the third right so uh thank you for your service man thank you what man. was your initial uh military experience like your first time going to boot camp and all that so that was february of 2013 everybody remembers the date man <laughs> <laughs> february 6th on the date february 6 2013 um i was 19 years old fresh out of a semester of community college uh and it was a wild one man like <laughs> like it was cold i'll tell you that um yeah chicago's cold yeah man that shit that shit well I, can i cuss i'm sorry yeah yeah man oh, tear no, it up okay. yeah shit, shit. just just don't yeah. say uh don't don't say that song from um the one that goes mother mother fuck mother mother fuck fuck yeah yeah no, 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 skip no. that <laughs> yeah <laughs> but uh yeah um it was cold as shit man like it was cold to the point where i remember i had to get i had to get issued a new scarf because uh in the middle of the training cycle um i i got taught how to swim thanks to the navy uh but it was like my third attempt and it was gonna be like my make or break before I got uh as mode back to a yeah. to a different <laughs> yeah. You get kicked, you lose your whole division, back. you get kicked back because you can't swim. It happens to a lot of people. It does. It does. Yeah. I remember, too, so side note, there was a there was this one dude. I don't even know why he joined. He was a straight up bodybuilder. Body, I mean chiseled figure. And like he did everything right. But he literally could not float for the same life. He does not. But he could swim. Float. He swam and cut through the water like no excessive like splashing, but just straight fast as fuck. But this dude on treading water just could not mm-hmm. tread water. He ended up graduating. He was in part of the same graduation class. He ended up graduating. So like, I wonder if he I because I left once once I got I gotta go. I didn't. I knew he was still. He was still trying. So I was like, mm-hmm. Oof, "Bro, all right, man. Like, good luck." <laughs> hey, man. Uh, I I have a lot of friends who are instructors in the, in the navy right now, and they're at um, you know, the recruit training command RTC over there in Great Lakes, Yo. <laughs> and they will push people through if they're like really out there. It's like one fluke. It doesn't mean you can't be a great sailor. No. Yeah. And and at the end of the day. Is it really? Is it really that serious? Yes, yes, it is that serious to make sure you meet all the training requirements. But a lot of training requirements are um are just repetitive, and they're just passed through by some person who just pushes paper. So, uh, yeah, I, like hey, you know, you and maybe the Navy isn't right for you if if you can't swim. There's other there's other branches. There's other branches. There's space well, Force. Hey, swim that's and, what I thought about the space. Army. That's what I thought about the Army, but I'll talk. I'll go about that in a little bit also. Okay, man. But, uh, so so, you, so you're in boot camp. It's cold as shit uh what like what what are the things you remember the most about boot camp if 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 i if i've never heard about boot camp what you will you tell me um so you'll have if so first thing would be like if, you, if you're asking me like you know like what, what do i expect like what can i expect at boot camp well when are you going well i'm going this date okay well 
you got a special special operations contract no okay well there goes your luxury for that um <laughs> do you so you'll have one or two choices and it usually just depends on i don't know do i'll never forget fucking what's her name what was her fucking name petty officer dominguez maybe Maybe. I can't remember. I can't fucking remember, really. That's too far back. But anyways, I remember there was a there was a petty officer, first class, as we were getting processed in and everything, through the doors, and we raided the piss test or whatever. And she was like, she like, it was like two of the guys that, that she already pulled off. And it, it was like by random, but I think it was generally by, if you looked a certain way, and you looked fit, you had a decent ASVAB score, um, they pulled you off to the side and they asked like, Hey, can you do, what was the requirement? Like, can you do 75 pushups in two minutes? Can you do 85 sit-ups within two minutes? Can you run a mile and a half in what? 10? 10. Can you swim? Yep. And they ask you all these things. They're like, and if you say yes, right. If you, you know, you, and you really don't know. Cause I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I know I trained up, up for it, but, uh, and even then, I still fucked up this one. But anyways, yeah. So like, you answer yes to all four of those questions because you're like, fuck it, I'm just say yes because like I you and you should say yes. You should say yes and just test yourself. Fuck it. If you fuck up, you fuck up. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're like, all right, perfect. You go over here. If you get pulled off to the side like that, you're into what's called the 900 divisions, which are your staff divisions. They're like the accelerated program, but you're not accelerated like your special operations. Um. And if you don't get into the 900 divisions, then you go into Gen Pop, which is like 700 and below. <laughs> but yeah. the 900 divisions where I was at, right, was we PT'd and our scores at the end of graduation was resembling just like almost close to the 800 divisions, which are 800s were your special operations guys, your SEALs, your SWICs, your EOD, all that stuff. Um, the short shorts. The, the bad yeah. asses. Yeah, Mr. High Speeds. Um, but yeah, so like your nine hundred divisions, right? My boot camp experience was was accelerated. It was very fast paced. We got through a lot of the events and evolutions quicker than the rest of the normal general populated divisions, really, because our main focus was the honor guard. The uh the recruit leadership, right? You know, your RPOC, AROC, and Master at Arms. Um, and then you had your uh your guys up in the stands directing people as they're coming in to sit where they're supposed to sit according to yes. their, you know, where they yeah. So for nine by my unit, division nine nine two two, damn. <laughs> um a lot of it like the last, I wanna say last month roughly was i could be wrong but uh the last month roughly of of boot camp was, was drill work yeah drill drill uh, uh dnc 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 i mean we did about like five graduations four or five graduations before it came to our graduation mm-hmm. and uh honestly like yeah like for anybody trying to go in and like this i mean we're talking like 10 years ago right but I would still say if they're still doing like your 900 divisions, gen pop and spec op, like if you don't have spec op, try to get to the 900 divisions because that's where you're going to really, really advance through. It's going to at least help you in terms of getting your getting that that work ethic and that mentality to be driven, essentially, because that's what my uh, RDCs were doing us because they knew that we they told us off rip what we were doing. And so well, they said, if you fail at any one of these events, we're going to fucking asthma you, asthma you out. We'll get you yeah. the fuck out. We got schedules to do. Um, and yeah. So they, say they, you, they basically set you apart from everybody else and, and want you to be oh, pretty better much. than them. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Absolutely. So you get, so you get a, a little, a little toast, a uh, little piece of advancement into a, like a lower ranking system of this, uh, of this, these standards. <laughs> Very cool. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I was, I was in G pop because I didn't even ask me to this. Um, they didn't ask me any of these questions because I could swim great. I could swim great. 
I guess we're really great. I could run really good. I was I was smoking most of the scores in my division. Uh and I never got winded when I was doing any running. So and we ran a lot because we had we had some uh we had some people who were Completely, completely physically debilitated and they were not ready. I don't know how they got past, um, you know, the MEPS. I didn't know how they got past MEPS to even get into the military because these people, yeah. they were not prepared at all. They came to, and it's really a disservice to um, not just the train, the trainings, uh, the training petty officers and chiefs, but mm-hmm. also the people around you to see, Hey, um, this recruiter doesn't give a shit. They put you in unprepared that you're just a number to them. And it and it really shows that type of uh, recruiter that you got. Uh, my recruiters were great. Um, and, and I'm thankful for them every day. They were, yeah. they were relatively honest with the information they knew. And yep. uh, there's only a little bit of confusion about it. But um, ultimately, they did a great job getting me in. And when I was done with the, the I think one of the most memorable things from the military um, with the Navy boot camp is, just shut the fuck up and do what you're told. It's that simple. Just shut up and do what you're told. When you're done, then you're free. You're free. Just do your job and leave. It's not that hard. You don't have to sit there and you don't need to know why everything happens. All you need to do is understand that if somebody, you you have to trust other people and you have to yeah. listen to what they say. And if you don't trust this person, you're going to ask those questions. Why, 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 why? Um, when I was in a leadership position in the in the Navy, when I graduated and, and got some more accolades to my name, people started trusting me more because I would display my skills that I've rehearsed uh, relatively mm-hmm. easily with, with ease because I listened to people that were smarter than me. It doesn't take a lot. You just got to check your ego and be willing to learn. And thankfully, yeah. thankfully I did uh, apply just that to it because being a student in life doesn't mean you know everything. I don't know yeah. everything. That, that's, why I, that's why I started doing this podcast because um, I have a bunch of different series coming up about me just learning about stuff. This is about me learning about stuff right here. I had no idea that that um that there were there were mothers out there that like that were that strict that it would it would cause and sow seeds of dissent in their children. I had no idea that it could cause issues later down the road. And but yeah. I do know that for me, having father issues can cause issues down the road. And I share that I share that as open and honestly as possible, man. Um, yeah, we all have different paths. So what we're Absolutely. What was your first duty station after you left boot camp and you got your your A school? What did you what what were you sorry? What was your job in the Navy and was your A school anything like what you touched in the fleet at all? So all right, so I was a machinist mate, conventional. Okay, um, not, so not the nukes. Li- no, 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 no. Okay, because I was about I, to shut this thing off, man. <laughs> <laughs> I, no, I got screwed. I got screwed in a way, uh, because um well, not really, because like that last year of my of my contract, they were finally paying all the conventional machinist mates uh, an extra one hundred fifty uh, a check, um, because we like made an effort to basically say if we're standing and understanding in a nutshell naval nu- nuclear propulsion systems, right. Pay us, like, you, pay us or keep our share. You're gonna pay. You gotta pay us something, right? Because yeah. you're you're having us for us to like under like to to what we learned in a school, which is just a basic, you know, boiler. Uh, boiler lights up. You get your temperature. You get your water. You get your feed in. Feed is flashed into steam. Steam runs through the system. After it's pushed out through the system. It goes through some chill water, get passes through a heat extend heat exchanger, gets condensed at a lower temperature. That then turns from steam to condensate. The condensate then gets drained, and then repeats the cycle. Condensate turns to feed. Feed goes into mm-hmm. feed generation, condensation, feed generation. Yeah, yeah. Could, it's, it's a step. never ending loop. It's a never ending loop, yeah. and that's what and that's what I yeah. learned uh, when I was learning about the the MM rate uh, that. I learned exactly that. And it was really cool. Um, I can't name it off as, just as good as you, man, but honestly, but um, did you, so did you, were you working in with the engineer officer of the watch or did you spend a lot of time with like in the, in the fleet with the nukes? Okay. Uh, so yeah. So a school was great lakes and I felt like it was like a co- college experience kind of, but I was 19. So I really couldn't really, I was 19. I would say like not knowing what, to do because mm-hmm. i mean 
19 years old, still on base, kind of scared. Ooh, big Navy. But got out to the fleet. Um, wasn't really working too much with the E E double O. Um, it was more of uh, I forgot what it, it was. But just the 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 emergency backup diesel generators. No, those were your engine men, okay. which to the those ends. guys during my time during my time were pretty pretty cool cool buddies. And uh, so fuck, so we had the, I just had a regular engineering engineer officer, and uh, because like you had DC Central right mm-hmm. where your E I was in there. And then you have like your water control watch there. Okay. I didn't get to qualify to water control watch and it was close to the end of my career. So, and I was getting forced out. Uh, so I was just like, fuck it. I'm not really bothering it. Same thing with my air call. I just started saying fuck it. Cause I was getting forced out. I couldn't get billets for it. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so I stood up a level, up level port starboard, lower level port starboard. I did shaft alley to keep uh, proficiency. Uh, I did auxiliary operator, as a uh as a proficiency which is like a, a oversized heat exchanger basically but it's like a really boiler quote unquote um but i was in the main engine rooms for the most part you know uh my shop was primarily the shaft alleys so on the george washington which she was stationed in yokosuka naval base so that was my first she was my first and only command, but I was stationed in Yokosuka Naval Base over the two and a half years uh, before it was time for her to go for overhaul. Um, and that was like the defining, I guess, the, the beginning of what would be... Uh, it would be like the beginning of like who I would... of who I would become later on and where I am right now. Because... Mm-hmm. That was free range, foreign country, all the little sneaky things that I knew to like not get in trouble with mom. I don't have to do as much, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, Because you're going to have your LPO or your chief still looking at you, making sure you're not getting into trouble and everything. But uh, like that was was amazing. And I still, to this day, I would still love to, to go back to Japan. Like it was just so different, simpler, better, happier times. <laughs> <laughs> um, and compared to like when I went out to the fleet, like just know to any service member that is going through basic, going through AIT or A school, whatever, like just just hold out. I know it is bullshit. Everything is bullshit. In a training command, everything yeah. is bullshit. It's all it's all fabrication, out, illusion, and optics. When you get to your unit, it's so much better. Just make it to your unit, and then take that, take that for for its value. Take take the years and experience there, and then make the judgment of like, all right, the army is not for me. I I just I hear too many people saying and already condemning the military based off of their initial training experience and like i get it but at the same time like that has nothing to do with shit like the yeah. training is nothing like that's a whole separate world The i remember boot in, in boot camp at a school they have you uh, address people as petty officers they don't have you do that in the military and that might be because of a lack of a military bearing or whatever but yeah when you're when you're out in the in the military these walls that, that separate us this rank that separates us so so strongly in boot camp and in a school it doesn't do that in, at all because guess what you're probably like it's different for the deck department because you know once you're a bm3 you're separate you are immediately thrown into leadership that that first classes and chiefs usually do um but Damn. yeah <laughs> and, and, I, and i'll tell you i'll tell you more about that uh pretty shortly but they they don't do any of that stuff they don't care like oh you're a, you're an e4 so guess what you you still have to chip paint and and paint and and, and do you know e1 e3 stuff absolutely not when you're when you're a bm3 you don't have you don't you're expected to not do that you're expected to to take the job from the person above you and if you don't 
you're considered a shit bag. So yeah. you have to you have to do every single qualification possible. You have to go to Coxon School and drive the fast boat for men overboard. You have to take every every firefighter uh, skill that you can apply. And and I mm-hmm. love being I love doing. Uh, everyone hated hated general quarters. I thought it was cool. I love to do to do to do anything firefighting related. Anything that has to do with learning a job that's not mine, I enjoyed. I was completely just obsessed and enthralled around this idea of man. I get to do something that's not my job on top of already doing my job. Great. Let's do it. Yeah. Firefighting. You want me, oh, you want me to go stop a fire? Easy day. Um, and I've, <laughs> and I've, I've stopped three fires on, on different ships and that was fun, but, uh, and that was just me being alone, just being paying attention. Uh, well, I stopped a gas event from killing my birthing full of my friends and, and people I was stationed with when we were in the yard still, because gas leaked all over my birthing and everyone was passing out. Um, I've done, I've done like all you got to do all these crazy things, but these boundaries that separate us don't exist. And you know what? Like at the end of the day, the only boundary that separates, you know, the enlisted people, like as far as levels go is usually once you're put in an occupational uh, role. Right. So, Mm -hmm. um, so as far as leading petty officer, LPO or ALPO, we don't care who the ALPO is. It's the LPO. Okay. And then, but you could, you always have the, the appointed leaders, and the real leaders, and that's what really yeah. set. I do honestly believe separates us, man. Because how many times have you seen the person who made rank, and they're just horrible, horrible to other people. Yeah. They're rude to other people. They think they think less of them. And I, yeah. and and that like folds down because at a point in my life in in the military, I was striving to be like this person who puts other people down, and now I'm a douchebag. And no one, no one wants to, no one wants to deal with douchebags. We want to deal with nice people who get the shit done. And uh, the best thing to do is lead by your example. So that's what I was able to experience. Like the biggest thing I learned from my military leadership is shut up, do what you're told applies to everybody else. They should know that you don't have to tell them that they should already know that. And if they don't know that you can educate them. But another great thing to do is instead of uh, just educate them to shut up and know they're told, you can inspire them to do great things themselves. Uh, and, mm-hmm. and we can do that same thing as parents as well. If any parents yep. listen to this, you are a leader. It doesn't matter what your job is. As a parent, you're a leader. Mother, father, yep. and, and some sisters are, and, and brothers are leaders. I'm a leader. My wife is a leader to, to our little brother of hers like we have these things that we have to step into and you don't get to choose always oh man i can't wait to be a dad when i'm not ready and you never you're never ready you're never ready to be a parent all you do is keep trying to be better and if you have that same mentality when you go to the military you're gonna do fine just try to be better just shut up and do what you're told ask questions after there's plenty of time plenty of downtime hey why did why did i why did they uh why did they tension this high line between two ships and why did this? Uh, why did they not slow down the rig when it slammed into our king post on an unrep station, causing, causing all the pallets to explode everywhere and, and everyone's mail to go flying? Or why? Why? Why are apples dropping on out of the sky right now? Oh, probably because someone didn't do their fucking job right. Yeah, uh, there, there's, there's so many different things, man. But um, yeah, dude, it, there's so many differences. Since so, like in the. In the reactor world and the propulsion side, it's like kind of like the same thing, right? Mm-hmm. Like you would have, you know, MM ones, MM twos coming out of like naval nuclear school or power oh, no. school prototype. They ain't they ain't got their surface or, or whatever. They're but book they're smart. They don't know anything. I, I I I've been in for this amount of time, and uh, it might it might be due to a lack of lack of military bearing, like you said, but it's like. When we were in the plant, it's knowledge. It's whoever is your senior watch station. It's not necessarily a third class or whatever. Like, no. A third class could easily be chief machinery operator, which within the machine room, that was top dog within the machine room. Now, granted, he had his own bosses, but, like, he was in charge of that entire team, including any under instructs. And we had under instructs that were, I know I've had one, uh, had a couple that were E5, E6, E7, a couple of officers. And uh, if they did not know what they were doing, because I would ask them, like, hey, do you know, how much do you know so far? And uh, it was. 
Yeah, and like the first classes, I had a couple of chiefs, a couple officers. Like, if they simply just, and regardless if they, it was if there was like their next command, if there's something like that, they were, uh, just requalifying just so that they can get you know watch supervisor or whatever. Like, same, but like regardless, like I, look, I don't care how cool we are, right? Like, put cool, quote unquote. Um, if you don't know what you're doing, right? Like. Because the, the situation is, God forbid, I collapse, right? We're in a very heat, stress-induced environment where we are required to not only, you know, lift, <laughs> per job description, lift 50 pounds or greater for extended periods of time. Um, are, you have your big valves, which you got to put some muscle behind it to open them, boys. You know, you got a couple of valves that were just regardless of how much maintenance you did, you know, a lot of physically strenuous activities done in, you know, a hundred degrees plus. Yeah. Like, how hot was, do you, do you have like a thermometer down there? Because I know um, in our office at one point it was 160 degrees, 160, 160. So I almost, they, I could almost shit they, myself when I seen that temperature, <laughs> that thermometer, man. <laughs> <laughs> they, uh, they take the temperatures, get this, they take the temperatures, uh, the thermometers, and they put them in front of the vents because that's where it's supposed to be hanging out at. Swap standing watch, right? On the flip side of that, too, is a double-edged sword. You're supposed to be patrolling your watch station, cleaning up oil, making sure it's clean, putting stuff away, um, and all that stuff. And it's like, all right, so you want me for, like, what, every five minutes to do it? 10 minutes but i'll do it every five minutes right i'll just walk around just check everything every 10 minutes whatever and then you come down you're like why are you sitting on the 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 handlebars i'm cooling off before i have to like walk again go walk now what the like yo it's just because it says and that's toxic leadership man don't just just because it says a, a hundred in the thermometer right now does not make it seem any less hotter that the moment i get out of this vent And I just feel like, dude, it got, dude, it would be so hot just opening up those, those doors going down to the plant. Like I've described it as like, you literally, you literally felt as if there were hands grabbing you. Mm. Mm. And a lot of people, a lot of people have never experienced this heat. I spent a lot of time uh, going down to the machine rooms because, and um, the shaft alleys and stuff like that. One, I wasn't supposed to be like anywhere like near that stuff, right? In the TLD spaces or whatever, right? Yeah, I did yep, whatever yep. I wanted. I didn't listen to that at all. I definitely spent a lot of time walking around in these spaces, right, where you, you need to have this certification or whatever. I I was spending time in machine rooms. I was going to a different spot, walking around. I was interested. I was like, you're gonna give me an ESWAS pin and lurch to surface warfare specialist and not have me actually know this shit. I wanted to see. I want to know where the ammo is. So guess what? I got to hang out with the GMs and, and shadow them and, and do a lot of learning experiences with yeah. different different rates. I wanted to know what the what the MMs did. I want to know what the LSs did. I wanted to know why my flight deck boots uh didn't didn't show up because I'm pissed. I, I, I wanted to know all these things and and um and it was such a overwhelming and great beautiful experience to see other people uh yep. light up when you actually want to know what they do. And mm-hmm. the morale is important. If you have a bad morale in a ship, bad things happen, man. Suicide, violence, uh, depression, um, shitty job doing, uh, can't yep. focus, lack of sleep. Yep. Some people went, had like, I call it cabin fever. They went completely stir crazy. Actually, we had a couple cases of insanity happen while we were deployed, uh, one of which was an extremely violent situation. And then another instance, um, I walked into a, a the left side. Uh, it was on the first deck. Or sorry, the mm-hmm. second deck, and then I was walking on the, on the up on the port side of the ship, right near the birthings where the MMMs and everyone was sleeping. On the it yeah on the on the George Wash it was the same same spot right. Mm-hmm. So you walk the left side and you about to hit officers the officers valley where the um where the, all the different people's quarters are the exo sleeping quarters and all that stuff his office down there, and yeah. I almost uh I almost like didn't almost didn't step in because. At the time, I didn't know if I if I should have or not because I I don't trust a lot of people who do things with guns occupationally. I don't trust them. There was a uh, two security guards trying to fight and pull a guy off of uh who was strangling this this young lady, 
and it was one of our sailors strangling another sailor. I don't know why. I don't care why. Fucking God. Um, and and these guys were were not getting the job done. I don't know if they just didn't lift weights or or what. If you're in the military, lift weights. But they were trying to get this person off this, and he was deranged, screaming, "I'm gonna fucking kill you, bitch!" I don't like people trying to harm other people for no reason. So uh, yes. and she was just trying to to breathe, and her face was turning all sorts of colors. It was nighttime, but I you could see in the red light the the life starting to leave her. Um, oh my god! I ran, up, I ran up and kicked the dude in the face, in the jaw, because you know a lot of people don't know the jaw is the button. You just pin them right on their button. They might go to sleep. You never know. Roll the <laughs> dice. Try harder. So I kicked the like, with my steel toe boots. I just sent him across the jaw, knocked him out. Um, he he released her. Thankfully, they, she was still breathing. And uh, one of the guys took her to medical after I helped this guy cuff the other the other person. And yeah, and small things like that. Um being aware of your sailors conditions around you know yeah. whose families are going through tough times i have had to tell people their family members were have been shot and unfortunately you know i had to, i had to tell them also some people that hey you can't go home because they're not on your emergency list i'm sorry yeah. they're not your immediate family member it's so and it, and it hurts to do there's a, a lot it of crises sucks. i had a, i suffered a, a couple crises back home where i couldn't head home and uh, it, it eats you alive. There's no way around it. Being in the military and having an issue back home is the worst thing. Doesn't mean we don't need to know, but it is a crippling feeling to be completely helpless, thousands of miles away from your, your family, depending on yeah. what you're doing occupationally. Yeah. Have you ever experienced anything like that? Like when you were deployed? So, yeah, like a couple of times, um, far too many, really. But like happens, I guess, when you are you're in the military in general, but, um, uh, one of my high school buddies found out that he, a couple of them actually found out that they committed suicide. And before family found out, it was obviously just within the friend groups, we would find out first and we're like, Oh fuck. Like what the fuck? And obviously, like you said, you know, they're not on our emergency list or anything. So there's nothing we can do other than just watch the heartbreak the memorials the facebook memorials being posted one after the other after the other and you can't even go to the funeral right and this is sucks um yeah like i know my best friend like the one that one of the ones that hit me hard was uh my best friend like my ride or die homie, his grandparents were basically like my grandparents. I didn't grow up with my grandparents, unfortunately. Um, they were either in a different country still and or different state, way too far. There was bad blood between my 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 parents and all that shit. But like my buddies' grandparents took me in as their own, basically, mm-hmm. and then when you know abuelo passed remember him you know hitting me up on facebook i got that internet time and he's like hey so i just want to give you a heads up like you know, grandpa died and i was just like wait what and then like it was like probably like three four days later man you know grandma in the past and two i was like fuck and i can't go can't go to to the fucking funerals because one they're not blood but like Two, I grew up, you know, with them basically through like the more pivotal moments of my high school, and just sucks. Absolutely, uh, hardships hardships hit the military differently because um, you're supposed to like a lot of people, and a lot of people call the military like a, a very prestigious thing to do, which it is. Uh, and there's a lot of ups and downs to it. I think the biggest down to the military is not being able to be there for people that need you back home. And yeah. a lot of I I I spent some time in the military with people who signed up when they were homeless. They didn't even have a home, mm-hmm. and their recruiter helped them get through the process and all that. But having a home and having people that reside there can be a a mind controlling burden at the wrong time. Um, and yeah. Other times it could be it could be the reason you you power through and come home. Um, for my stepdad, yeah, that was a big thing for him because he was over over in the Middle East, uh, boots on ground type stuff, and he tells me. 
he told me just the other day that the number one thing powering him through coming home was the idea of being able to, you know, see his see his son and his daughter and his wife again at the time. Mm-hmm. Right? Now, now him and my mom are divorced, but hearing that it it always authenticated it like brought authentic authenticity to yeah. that that yearning to to come home and yearning to be there at the same time. Um, yeah, a, lo- a lot of my friends have experienced the why am I not with my boys over overseas and why am I back home? They yeah. They don't understand the the big mix up that have taking taking leave or transitioning out of the military has. Um, before I talk about transitioning out of the military with you, mm-hmm. what are are there any significant great things you want to talk on uh, as far as memories and or lessons? I would I would say probably on the lesson side. What lessons would you give and and share that you've learned? Um. To, if you depending on I mean I'm pretty sure it's like so this one is a little bit more navy specific but like do study like I'm gonna say that do study be be the one to like try to be driven as much as you can and I get you know toxic leadership you know is is what's is what kind of forced me out out of the navy as well like with all you new chiefs, you know, once again, congratulations on uh, being selected for chief. You know, a couple of my, my people that were in around my time, like, I hope you guys remember where you guys came from and you guys are, are, are literally going to end up making the difference. You know, when you guys get up to the higher up positions where you can start making policies and changes, like, please, this is this would be our time for us to reshape the Navy to where we need, we need it to be, but... Um, if when you, when you, uh, to any, you know, anybody that's going to be reporting to their unit and or shop and get to your team or whatever, um, make sure you look good. First impressions last, take a bit like as a, as a job interview, you know, they want to be able to know that you're not a shit bag, that you're on top of your shit, you're squared away and then attach yourself to the person who is considered hot shit. I don't care if they think that they're they don't want you around. You're too annoying. Nah. Guess what? You're 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 the dude that got his uh service warfare in within, a row. Yeah. Yeah, you're the dude that got his service warfare within a month. All right, so I'm following you. And your senior in rank. All right, I'm following you. I'm I'm sucking sticking with you. I don't care. Um for those look that do end up getting out of the Navy. Had a couple of buddies do this also. The blue to green program is still alive and well. Do not let them lie to you. The army, even though I'm in National Guard, everyone can talk shit all they want. However, comma. I know National Guard guardsmen and guardswomen that have more bodies than the people in the army. Yeah. Yeah. And that's not necessarily a great thing, but hey, you know, it doesn't mean that they do things hey, that are less yeah. serious. Um, 100%. And, I've and how had many, more- there's a lot of army movies, but the hills have eyes. That's the reason I didn't join the National Guard. Uh, <laughs> that's a good movie, though. Um, but like, uh, like, even though I've only did, I went through six months of infantry OSA, one stop unit training, and uh, drill sergeants that I've had there, like, I've had more mentorship, leadership, and actual career advice on how to advance where to advance how to begin steps one two and three for option a b and c never had that in my entire four years of my naval career but in my training my initial training into the army into an infantry unit essentially to be an infantryman and i had drill sergeants and I'm grateful for it because, you know, the army has this program called prior service. Um, and like, you do get awarded certain privileges and it's usually based off of like battalion commander and all that stuff. But like for my experience going through, uh, infantry OSIT, like grateful for the drill sergeants that were able to actually like kind of reinstill that, that faith that I had within the military. Now, granted the military, it's still you're still gonna have your bad apples, but mm-hmm. 
from my current experience, which I'm hoping it will continue on right now, like the army takes that NCO, like once you hit sergeant, they really take that whole NCO role very seriously. And you need to be that mentor and that leader for your soldiers. Badass man. I'm happy. I'm happy that you have having that experience. For me, uh leadership in the military was was kind of difficult for me seeing other people. Yeah. Um you get you get, we get thrown into it young. It, you're not talking about no you know E six or E four is gonna be the leader. <laughs> Usually it's a it's a BM three or sometimes a, just an E three that you trust. Um I can name tons of, of great sailors like on, on the top of my head that were you know mm-hmm. had wisdom beyond the years. Tyler Eights, uh Patrick Kelly, Thomas LaBarge. Like I, uh, Josie Segas to me, like I can go down the list of great yeah, people who yeah. influenced me and made me want to be a better person, uh, as a leader. And they, they weren't like when I was an E2 and E, like I made E2 in boot camp because I, I was on top of my shit. And it was, there was mm-hmm. no need for me to, to, to listen to people who didn't were on top of their shit and not, and not because it wasn't, I was cocky. Like I still respected their, their little, you know, pin on their, on their collar device or whatever. But I was good. Mm-hmm. I knew when I got in the military that I was going to surpass every person who wasn't actively working on being better. And that wasn't yeah. because they sucked. They just weren't actively working on being better. They'd rather spend their time uh, in the military drinking after work or whatever. I had a, a girlfriend who I loved at the time turned into my wife. I didn't go out and, and chase pussy. Uh, I spent my time studying. And people will tell you to this day, I'd be up. I'd have alarm set in the middle of the night going off. And I'd wake up on the first couple rings of my alarm. On my cell, on my cell phone, to go. Ring. Mm-hmm. Second one, I was up, pressing silence, and start. I start studying for an hour, and then I go back to sleep. I, I have a, uh, I have. I'm known for doing stuff like that, and and staying up. And I'd have a. I got a tablet. My wife gifted me a tablet. Um, girlfriend at the time, and I loaded all the BM Bosomate manuals on there, um, and then and nav eds. And I'd go around and I'd look at the applications we have in in real life, like unwrap and and and. Mm-hmm. and boat operations i'd look at it all right here and i'd say hey this isn't right what the fuck so the next day i'd go to my my off my uh my leadership chief brontes and and uh bm bm3 anderson at uh seaman anderson to bm3 anderson uh to bm2 anderson i still like i still look up to these people and uh um i remember lieutenant junior grade bayless um who's now mr bayless uh and he's he's out of here and he's one of the greatest individuals the anchor uh, sorry, the Evolution podcast is what he hosts, and he's had me on a couple times to, and he just being being it like he, when you hear his voice, it tells you everything you need to know about who you want to be in the world. It's like mm-hmm. this this crazy extraterrestrial moment of of knowing exactly <laughs> where, who you want to be when you listen to somebody who's full of knowledge, full of leadership, who really does give a shit about you so much more than themselves, yeah. and wants you to have an impactful life and be a great human being. And cares about you like their own child. Chief Brontes did that for me. Um, a lot of people used to used to um, to call him my dad. And at first, it was a it was a really big insult because um, like I was having issues with my father at the time, and I took it I took everything really mm-hmm. personal. I had a chip on my shoulder. Um, a lot of people don't didn't know my violent history with my father. And yeah. leaving for the military, I didn't. I needed. I needed powerful strong men who have big hearts who will cry over the smallest thing in a movie uh and who who can who can hug you if you're if you're feeling really low who can teach you something new if you want to learn and if you don't want to learn it's okay you're still going to do your fucking job um that that is what that's what chief brontes was to me he's more than any any young man who had uh a fucked up past can can ask to be and yeah, people sport, like yeah. there's never a chief like that in the navy ever again. And he he made senior chief, and uh, he sh- he should have been goddamn Mick Pond. Uh, he's the most amazing individual I've ever came in contact with that wasn't in my family at all. Yeah, yeah. Ever. yeah. And leadership like that, uh, being great fucking human beings, that art is lost. That quality is lost. And uh, I, oh, fuck, dude, the lead. Like I could, I could cry talking about him. Um, he came to, he, he stopped in Seattle not too long ago and I got to actually meet up with him and it was such a, a, you know, full circle moment. It was like, when I hear the words full circle, I think of that. 
he came to see me and I, I told him uh, how much of impact he had on me. And my wife told him how much of an impact fucking... he had on me. And I gave that's him a crazy. gift. Um, and he, uh. um, and he, he told me such great things. He talked about, we talked about the current state of the United States Navy and that, that leadership and, and, uh, and being a great human being are failing uh, in the military yeah. right now. And it's, it's important that we inspire other people to fill those roles. We need, we need more Bron- chief Brontuses. We need more senior chief Osbury's. We need more. Um, yeah. I'm not going to say there's a couple officers who were horrible, bro. There were a couple officers that would hit on the deck girls in, in deck. And uh, you know, I, I'm not ashamed to say, I'm not going to, you know, say any names because name. these, are, yeah, these, are, yeah, yeah. these are investigations. <laughs> But um, there are officers, and if you, I hope you hear this and know you're this is the biggest piece of trash in the entire universe. I I filed the open reports. I filed the investigations when you preyed on you know my young sailors when I was in a leadership role, and I uh, and I and I've, I've had a lot of a lot of words with uh, people, and I don't give a shit what their rank is. There's some things that mm-hmm. rank doesn't doesn't you know have any effect on. I I don't know if you've experienced any of this, man, but I I definitely had some times where people had this car device on their shoulder. And they thought they could do whatever the fuck they want. Like they so, make less than people who yeah. pick up garbage outside of it, and and they they thought they were ballers, and and they were very rude yeah. and and egotistical. Is my biggest problem with people like that. Yeah, I'm, I'm okay with being a voice of justice and being an asshole to people who are egotistical. Other than that, I keep it reserved. Mm-hmm. But these, those are not leaders. Have you ever experienced anything like that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh. Without saying names, you can say names. Uh, it was in a navy. Yeah, it was in a navy. Air it um, out, man. <laughs> they uh, there was this fucking first class, and I guess later on, as I found out, there was a couple other people within within the department as a whole. Um, that some of my female sailors and friends were telling me. But they were, uh, they had some fucking like sexual harassment charges against them yeah. and investigations up on them and everything. Mm-hmm. And uh, how, how, let me ask you this how long were you on the uh, George Washington for? I was on a G dub for 90, I think, I believe it was 94 days. I just, I, just I that 94 to, days. I have to go. I'd have to go back like two cell phones and look through the picture because I wrote every day on, on the whiteboard how many days I've been on the wrong fucking <laughs> ship. And uh, okay, and so, this, this got all the way to the XO, like the XO of the G dub back in 20, like 15, 16. Like that, that dude, he, we had, okay. some, we had that, all we had right. run ins. Like he was like, What is going on here? I said, I'm on the wrong motherfucking ship. That's what the fuck is going on here. I had to get like carted <laughs> away. People had to pick me up and I freaked out, man. They, they, you probably think I was insane if you didn't know what was going on. He probably did too. And I, I feel if I saw okay. him in real life, I'd be like, "Hey, I'm sorry for freaking out on you, man. It's not your <laughs> hey, fault." So I, I'm sorry. I, I, that, that's not me. Actually, yeah, that's not me. That's I'm not. better now. Um, We're in a better place. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, so tell, so tell yeah, me. So there was, yeah, there was this fucking uh, specifically. There was. I'll, I'll never forget. I remember I tried to put a packet to try out for the fucking Navy Boxing Club. Uh huh. Uh, my chief at the time, um, Chief Constantine, Chief Constantino, chief Constantine, which, of course, Constantino. Hey, he honestly, a lot of people say they didn't like him. Might have people might have even called him racist. I, I actually thought he was like right in the neutral spec spectrum okay. of things. Like he was very fair and like he was kind of like the old school dude of like you work hard. I'm gonna give you a reward. Absolutely. I mean, that's that's what I grew up on. Use my father as the no example. No sacrifice, no fucking... victory. Yeah, exactly. Like, yo, whatever you need, chief, I got you. Even, I mean, don't get me wrong though. I'm a fucking bitch, if, especially if it's something that I ain't want to fucking do, and you're asking me for the most inopportune time. I'll bitch, I'll bitch and moan the entire time, but it'll get done. A you complaining sailor is bed. a happy sailor, man. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, so I'm trying to put my packet in to go to the Navy boxing club and like at least try out for it and everything. Right. Like, did you like always boxing at the time? Box. I, uh, like, yes and no. Like I boxed and I learned how to box. Basically I had people who were actually in the sport when I was growing up mm-hmm. teaching me how to fight essentially. Um, and then yeah. I just took, I just took what they taught me. Like one of the things that I did was 
uh, this is back in Jersey, New York City Sports Club, and one of their studios for their personal training, when they had the bags hooked up, I would have my laptop out and then I would angle myself to where I could see the laptop and see myself in the reflection. And one of the fighters I used to, he used to copy because that's what it is essentially nobody no real fighter has like their own style everybody kind of copies their own and then adds their spice to it yeah um lemonchenko all right uh basically copying his movement his combos and how he like rotates in and out of the bag oscar de la hoya was i grew up on him mayweather Gotti. uh mike tyson's one of my favorites man marquez there you go um, but yeah, like basically I would watch their fights, watch them, see how they're throwing their punches and their positioning. And I would watch myself in the, in the mirror and just practice on that. Okay. Do I ever want to actually pursue boxing? I mean, look, I'm not, I'm at 20, I'm 28 years old right now. I don't think I'll actually ever make it big enough. Dude, I know. Don't ever, don't ever say anything in front of me that, that quells your <laughs> dreams, brother. Listen, man, you can do anything, anything. If you really, if you really want to pursue a goal, brother, all you got to do is, is shut off every single noise in the back of your mind that says you can't do it. Look at your, at a whiteboard or a wall or some shit or a piece of, like I, most people prefer a piece of paper. I like walls. I like writing on walls. Mm-hmm. My wife, got, more permanent. Like, I, I wrote on the walls and we had to paint over it and it, it, it is still popping through now. <laughs> uh, writing on, a, you can permanent. write on anything, write on anything and write down your goal. And you know what? Until you've achieved it, I want you to start to consider yourself an absolute failure and you're going to win. I promise you this because you'll, you'll, you'll be so driven to do that. And I don't like to deal in absolution. So that, that was obviously a joke, yeah. but when you write down your goal, make it sh- and and think about what goes into that, and start writing underneath that what the steps take to get to the goal. It's now tangible, it's real. Yeah, you can you can, you yeah. can pursue this honestly because I've 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 written I've written down goals. I've I've achieved every single goal I've ever written down. I've achieved, and like I don't know very many people who can say that. My goals are very realistic. Uh, my yeah. first goal was to not be skinny and weak. I went from 125 pounds to 100 and or sorry to 212 was my was my max out like how heavy I ever ever got, and then God I damn. dropped down and I, now I'm now I'm like one 186. I just weighed the other day 186, and as soon as my shoulder healed from my injury, I can start doing jujitsu, and I'm gonna do jujitsu for the rest of my life because I said this is a sport I can do for the rest of my life, and not just because I want I don't want to compete in it, but I want to yeah. do it because um because the life saving necessity yep. of it you know i yeah I, absolutely not, every, not everybody can stop themselves i don't want to punch people anymore my hands are all fucked up and scarred from that. <laughs> it's not fun hurting people is not great but you know what is diffusing a fight by by folding them up and and, and choking them out is good and i've been doing jujitsu without knowing what it was for a while so i might yeah. as well use my use use this uh this time in my life this life i have to be yep. the best protector for my family and all that so write down your goals man go after them see what happens all right. That being said, right. and I and, and if and you know what, we could talk off more offline about your goals and and how to structure a plan because I can tell you from from A to B how to achieve any goal in life. And the first thing you need to do is go to Machiavelli Motivation and watch yeah. Mike Tyson's <laughs> video on there. That's that's what I did. I I watched a motivational video and it changed me. It was Eric. Uh, yeah. Yeah. E. T. And and it was the. How, do you want to be successful? The brief, do you how like as bad yeah, as you want to breathe video yep. that got me through the most difficult times of my life when I didn't want to breathe anymore, when I didn't want to live anymore, when yeah. uh, my family was broken. I was living in a fucking crack house. So yeah, there's nothing that you can't do, man, as long as you commit to it. And <laughs> okay, <being> said, okay. <laughs> so you do the boxing thing, right? So you're and this guy says no. What did so, you say no? Like my chief, he didn't say no, but the paperwork just miraculously like never got sent so like all my special warfare packets I <laughs> Motherfuckers, man god damn what here's the thing though right so the fucking first class he played rugby and uh they sent him out to san diego to try out for the navy rugby team 
while he still was fucking invest still being under investigation. He still had charges on him. And uh what? Yeah. Now nah, I could be wrong. You know how many people you know how many people it takes to let that shit slide? So that means that means everybody in the lineup above him who knew about this investigation let it slide. Now I could be wrong, but as far as I remember, the dude had fucking sexual rash and like they could have been just allegations, which is still like if you if you have multiple allegations of sexual harassment or or, or any sharp case, mm-hmm. like you shouldn't be really dealing with anything. Like no. you need, I can you tell need you this to right be now. Not a single sailor, ever. not a a hundred percent, not a single sailor under my under my jurisdiction ever can say that I've pressed myself upon them. Like I, I stick by my fucking books. Like if I say I'm in a relationship with somebody, and it's not for everybody, but I said I'm in a relationship with my wife, girlfriend at the time, turned into my wife throughout my naval career. That is it. Congrats, by the that way. That's it. Thank you, man. I've best decision <laughs> I ever made. Uh, I wish the government wasn't involved in marriage. I think I wish. It was really just a purely choice that would make uh, all these yep. douchebags out there who cheat on their wife and then get divorces. Uh, that would give them an easy way out to to go ahead and be a coward and and break their vows somewhere else. But um, yeah, like me me being able to commit to this, all my all my sailors, like every single lady under my jurisdiction, knew who my wife was via Facebook mm-hmm. or I showed them pictures of her. Uh, they asked how she was. It was a normal. Uh, you know, these people became my my little family, my little family, mm-hmm. and it was really awesome. absolutely. I can't say the same for a lot of my, uh, you know, my counterparts. A lot of them, ha- we had to deal with some people preying upon our our deck girls, and it was a fucking issue. It was yeah. it's an issue with me. It's it as soon as you as soon as you these are like not like my daughters. I wouldn't say, but these are my my nieces. No, I, them, I mean I like called, hey, I told them all, like, I'm your they, uncle now. Your kids. I told them, I said, listen, I'm, your, I'm, your, I'm, your, I'm three years older than you. I'm your uncle. It don't, it don't matter how you feel. And if I see some, some fuckery around, I don't give a shit about these Navy, Navy standards. I'm going to do my best to protect you. I don't care if I have yeah. to file a report. I don't care if I got to whoop somebody's ass in, in a machine room or, or on the fucking in the windlass. I whip some ass anywhere. And, you know, if I lose, I lose. But, you know, I stuck up for something right. Yeah, absolutely. It's okay. I can lose. I've lost before. I'm not afraid of that. I got my ass whooped shit. <laughs> but it's okay. It's okay because I tried. We can't yeah, have man. this. We can't. Jeff Bayless said it best, man. We cannot expect people to do their best in the military if we don't give them our best individually. Like I can't. If I don't protect these deck girls, how am I exp- exp- supposed to expect them to respect my leadership? To listen to what yep. I say? I'm not their daddy and mommy, but they're here to follow my instruction. If I don't make sure my flock is safe, what type of shepherd mm-hmm. am I? And we can all be exactly. shepherds as far as leadership goes. But this guy, he just got the go, the go ahead to go hang out and have fun with the rugby. Or, I mean, he didn't. He did. So he didn't. He ended up didn't not making it, and then he came back and everything. And uh, it was just, it was just like kind of weird. It's like, hmm. So you were able to go to T T D Y to try out basically for a go sport. hang out. Like there's no, there's I no job you have to do there. I couldn't try out for the boxing boxing club. Like, weird, weird. That's fucked up. But whatever. I fucking just took it on the chin and then just fucking kept on trucking. And then mm-hmm. close to my end of, end of my naval career, it was like, well, we got no billets for you. So at that point, I was like, all right, fuck, fuck this whole, fuck this whole shit. Fuck this whole thing, dude. <laughs> that makes me sad, man. It makes me it makes me really sad to hear that for quite a few reasons. Um, a few of which being one, look how undermanned they are. These yep. idiots who were pushing papers back in 2015 who who um hired tenured Patrick Kelly, one of the only people I, I know who can honestly like he knows how to, he knew how to do his job from the enterprise. He came over, he taught so many of the 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 sailors on the enterprise mm-hmm. from the enterprise come over to the TR to teach us how to do things. I didn't know how to do things. There were people who were BM2s and BM3s who were supposed to be leading, unrep, bringing bombs to our ship, bringing food mm-hmm. to our su- supplies, mm-hmm. dropping fast boats, who didn't know what the hell they were doing. And you know what? What the fuck? Like, like they, no idea. Like, when we're in the dock, when we're in the docks, BMs, that, like, how, 
Usually, like, what's, what's a yard period? Like, two and a half, three years? That could be everybody who knows what they're doing. And it could be just bring, we're bringing in the seal dropouts. We're bringing in the people who failed at A school. We're people, bringing in people who are severely depressed, who have alcohol issues, got in trouble for ARIs in, in A school, lost their rate. And we're, we're, we're shepherding all these people as leaders. And we have to make them do things like save your life when you fall overseas or fall over in the water or jump over mm-hmm. the side because you want to commit suicide. We have mm-hmm. to do all that. So we're shepherding all these people. We, a lot of them didn't know what they were doing, bro. I was one of the first people who got sent TAD to the um, USS George H.W. Bush. And on the Bush, I got to learn from people uh, how to stand watch and all these things and uh, how, to, how to stay warm when it's freezing cold. Dude, it was 12, like 12 degrees outside. And I'm sitting there with a little girl like this. This girl must be fresh out of high school and it's freezing cold freezing cold how do you how, how am i supposed to stand there in a pumpkin suit when she didn't have one because i got gifted mm-hmm. one because i was i gave my pumpkin suit up and i sat there and i froze my fucking dick off because <laughs> and that's not this is me being me being kind to another human being it's sad mm-hmm. but um all right back in but it, it killed me to to you know see different people absolutely cripple and fail at, at mm-hmm. simple tasks like what are you supposed to do? Nobody knew. So they sent us TAD to different ships that were deploying in the yards. And then Patrick Kelly showed up and Thomas LeBard showed up. These guys who just got done with deployment. And they're like, look at you idiots have no idea what you're doing. And of <laughs> course, our um, super, super authoritarian regime there of, of people who made rank with no idea how to do their job were yep. so, they felt, you know, they felt pretty overwhelmed and, and disrespected mm-hmm. and uncomfortable with people who were ranking lower than them who knew they knew more. And this also reflects on them. Just because you know more doesn't mean you need to embarrass your leadership. We can all exactly. work together to make things happen. And you know what? Is it going to make them more lenient on you if you if you show them new things and teach them so they can be better instructors in their leadership role? Yes. So we did mm-hmm. get great training. And there was times where our chief Brontes had to step down and, and show these uh, younger sailors, shut up, stop embarrassing my POs. Here, POs, this is what you need to know. Now teach them. And that trickle, that fountain, that waterfall with multiple little lakes and stuff like that yep. um, is needed. We don't always need to move the rocks so things flow smoothly. Sometimes we need to create these pools in this long line of waterfalls and, mm-hmm. and just circle mm-hmm. around them for a second until we got shit figured out. And uh, my, my, my biggest, most appreciative moment in all of my time in the military, uh, when, when things really clicked for me, as what a leader needs to be at the end of the day, a leader needs to be humble, arrogant, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. an asshole, kind, have a big heart, little patience, and more importantly than anything, communicate selectively. Uh, All these weird, you know, this and that ultimately turn into being a a level-headed motherfucker who just is cool. It's not, it's not hard to, to spend your time, learning how to do your job better and share it with people. It's not, but so many people don't do it. And yeah. and, and that your, your, your story about this douchebag who had multiple sexual harassment cases against him. Like those don't just pop up out of nowhere. People don't just say, Hey, well, I'm a victim now. It's not no me. Like, like people say this me too shit is bullshit. It's not always just bullshit. And yeah. it, it applies to the military as well. A lot of times there are people out there that are horrible and they think they can treat young men and women fresh out of the middle out of high school like less than did you ever yeah. feel like you were treated like less than in ever yeah in the military oh in the military yeah like i i felt like man like i felt like i was caught in the middle like i wasn't wide enough to get I guess like acknowledge and or like push for for NAMs promotion, but then I also wasn't like too hot. like I was on the other uh, on the other side of the spectrum too. Like I was caught in the middle. Mo- majority of anybody if on the ship was all fucking Latinos. If they were, they were either like a warrant officer and or an officer, but from like way different departments, which I mean, they can't really help me. 
other than just, just give me advice as to like what I could do. Like I just had to like really force myself to like work and like you would think like minorities will tend to like stick together to try to like uplift each other and everything. But like that wasn't the case on top of that too. On the George Washington, man, lay out, yo, like the Philippine mafia fucking ran that whole fucking The Filipino ro- mafia runs the Navy. Bro, yo. And they never change it. Seven, they run the show. Seventh Fleet, like that was the shit. I'll, I'll never forget. I, I had a, I, I've seen a, an E3 or it could have been an E2 or one. I, I don't know. I don't know in the coveralls, but like, there wasn't a bird on his fucking collars. He didn't have a collar device. So no crows. I'm seeing a fucking chief talking to him. And they're talking to Gallo and shit. I'm like, what the fuck? And they're both. And like, yo, they're just, they're, they're not talking to each other. And like, he's correcting them. Nah, they bullshit because like, they know each other somehow. Mm-hmm. Like, get the fuck out of here, man. Like, and like. He talks to him. Him talks to a few of his buddies. Find out where he's at and this is not. Oh yeah, I know him. Don't worry, I got you. We'll, we'll put a good word in. Let's do this, this, this. Like, damn, bro. Like, what the fuck? You know, a lot of if if you're Filipino and you're listening to this and you don't know what the Filipino mafia in the Navy is, like somebody's lying to you. Okay, somebody you're outside of the loop not, because if, everybody knows what the Filipino mafia is. You know, no matter how, like, I don't care how old or young you are, if you're in the Navy. And you've heard you've heard about the Filipino mafia. You know what they do. They are it's like the most beautifully organized, hey, you're one of us things ever. And it's not necessarily like a bad thing, but if you ain't in the Filipino mafia, you ain't in the Filipino mafia at all. Did yeah, you um yeah. so was your were your chiefs at the time white? Because you said you weren't white enough um earlier. Yeah. Did you so you yeah. experienced actual I didn't racism do enough, because I I didn't do enough uh Lifted truck, mud and fish and hunting, country music. Oh, you weren't a country boy. And we, man, like I put it this way: when I when we dotted Virginia and shit, mm. the only reason I like country music is because the few friends that actually introduced it to me, Mako Apodaca, Donald Cubic, uh. There was a third guy I'm missing. I feel so I feel horrible for forgetting him. He was part of the crew. It's hard, it's hard TJ to remember Cook. a lot of names, man. TJ, TJ Cook. TJ Cook, right? Like, there's a few other people that introduced me to country music too. Like, they they kind of introduced me like to like, all right, we're not gonna introduce you to this like popular shit. We're gonna introduce you to some some old like you know Dolly Parton, Willie Nelson, mm. like that generation of old of old country music. Then they were like, they eased me into like, all right, so like, not too modern country, but like, here's some new country. I was like, all right. And then it was, uh, in general, it was, it was like an, uh, an adapt to survive. Cause like I'm in Virginia and I grew up being a Yankee, understanding that being in, you're in, you're in a Southern state now, you're in a predominantly white Southern state now. And these are all stereotypes and preconceptions that I've had growing up. And, uh, like, you're gonna, you just gotta be careful. You're gonna get fucking lynched. You're fucking, mm-hmm. you're not, you're, you're a fucking Latino, bro. They don't, gonna, they're gonna say that, like, you, you get your ass on the board. Did you get warned about that at all? Because, um, and, but real, real quick before you answer that, what about Hank Williams Jr.? I'd have you to did, look at my You didn't library. mention my boy Hank, okay? Country Boy Can't Survive. Oh my god, that is oh country boy can't survive. Yeah, listen, that's man, a good one. That's you a good a, one. You gotta listen to the live version. Um, it's the if you go to YouTube, it's the third one down. You'll see him with the old ass hat, and uh, he look when he looks old. You need to listen to that one. That's the good. The live version is hilarious. He loves his vets, man. Hundred first airborne. He he talks about him a lot in this in his song. Fuck so. yeah, fuck Please yeah. Do. But um, um, so you got told, you got warned about these. These and it's like, I wasn't, like hey you're yeah, Latino, like, you're in Virginia you're in the south now things are different here there's a there's cultural hatred brewed in and not to say that all white people are racist or all black people are racist or whatever the fuck right because yeah. um I'm sure there's there's been people who miss and message me before about things that I say uh there's a lot of people out, there are fucking racist I'm not I'm not putting a blanket statement on this shit but you said you yeah. were considered not white enough and you were warned hey being careful because you're Latino yeah and it's not like and this is what something that I grew I grew up with though, mm-hmm. like being 
as far as I can being remember, being brown in America it, in in certain areas, it can fucking like, get you killed. Yeah. Yes, and like, a lot of people don't know that. And it's like, well, do do you feel like you can get killed or, or this is not over here? I mean, do or, or do we make you feel safe? Like, no, motherfucker. Like, I I, I fucking how served, it works. Like, I fucking served with you. We fucking talk on a daily basis. There's times like I fucking I fought you. I fist fought you. I, like you're not dead. I'm not dead. I trust you. Like, shut the fuck up. Drink the beer with me, dipshit. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Um, a lot of people was... have never experienced that, man, and it can be hard for them to capture. I remember one of the most difficult experiences for me growing up as far as racism wasn't wasn't anything that happened to me. Somebody threw popcorn down on – I was sitting there watching a movie for the first time with me, my mom, and my dad. Mm-hmm. And he's from the south. He's from Macon, Georgia. He stood up. He turned around and said, are we all right, you racist motherfuckers? And then he started, like, getting shitty, like, out of nowhere. I guess it's a it's it's a normalcy for racist people, uh, in in areas of Georgia back when he was growing up, and this like this trauma hit him hard, dude, to throw popcorn at the black it was a guys. Trigger. Yeah, it was a trigger. And so he got set off immediately, and I, like a lot of people haven't ex- some people haven't experienced that. Like, I didn't experience that. No one ever threw popcorn at me before that. But these were some like ten year old, eleven year old, thirteen year old kids. The parents were like, here, mm-hmm. here's a couple hundred bucks. Go to the movies. I don't care. Like me, me and your mom are gonna get it in for or once in a year or whatever, right? So they sent the kids off and they were well, just being shitty. But what was that? Was that something you experienced in Virginia as well? Like racism? Like, not really. Uh, with the exception of oh man, it was so there was this bar called the Bank. That I just it just brought a memory actually. It's this bar called the Bank. Me and my boy. Colton Williams, um, we get a little drunk. Uh, he he more than more than I, and uh, there was these two girls. I guess he was talking to one, and the other one was a friend, which I I kind of knew her in passing. So like, we would eventually like talk. Nothing really happened between me and the friend. We just kind of stayed talking to each other, just just in a very like amicable platonic way yeah uh, i'm not sure what if if a boy did anything with with the other girl but like um there was a diner right next to the bar um that we we used to go that they ended up introducing us to um and it was i guess it was like family owned and there was this bald headed white man i think he was drunk and he was somehow related to Colton's chick real quick and there was a black dude sitting in the back corner I remember that it was a couple I think they just got done with the bar us four already ordered we're just waiting to pick up our food and and like chow down and everything and uh yeah he just starts yapping her about and then he starts throwing like the n-word out i'm like bro whoa and like, like i'm like, looking over I, at... like i hate so like you, we, can say, we, we can say it here like... man so i need i need you to speak in context so did he say like hey was he, was he dissing this guy? Art, like hey man. nigger like like really fucked up like as as deep as as horrible as he could go <laughs> and but man because some people i like i have friends and i've personally been called that while getting ran down by neo-nazis like thank god i thought on my feet in the situation i'm still alive to talk about it but like yeah, everybody's holy everybody shit. had different different uh their, he wasn't their yeah, that he wasn't like talking he wasn't talking like down like trying to like trying, trying like, to belittle you know, somebody but he was using it in common commonality quote end quote he's not like them other others blank he's oh. he's the good blank I'm like bro oh, he's not like those other bro. niggers he's a good nigger That's oh what he said. my god he like, said those words yeah, that's got to be the most you know, small-minded, here. idiotic person I've ever heard of. Man. And Colt, and Colt, right? Colt is uh, like he's from he's from the bios in Louisiana, and like he's deep south. But like he was like, oh man, like I hate fucking racist ass motherfuckers. Like I'm motherfuckers would be saying like you know, well, I'm with and shit like that. Like yeah, I don't fuck with it. Like I don't say mm-hmm. it. I don't think any of my friends should be saying it. Anybody mm-hmm. that like just should not be saying it. Just just to be fucking out with it. If you're not 
if you're not if you're not it you're not it and if you're not you don't belong to it, you don't belong to it just fucking remove it from your vocabulary and i'm looking at him as all this is playing out i'm like yo <laughs> where, that racist where... couple like when you say those words some people think they're getting lynched like if you say if like if if there was a person right next right down the, in, in my house right now and he said oh blah 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 nigger i think I think this person is trying to trying to kill my dad. Like, yeah. I think this person wants my grandpa, who is a Black Panther, to die. I think this person doesn't want to hold me as a child because my grandpa on my on my white side of my family, my mom's grandpa and mm-hmm. grandma, didn't want to hold me as a child because I was black, and to them I was a nigger. Like God, that's man. what that that's what this this that word carries. So some some people don't know what that word carries. Some people don't know the word nigger means. Like I want to fucking string you up, cut off your dick and ears, and and send it to a black family in my area. Like a lot yeah. of people don't know how severe it really can be. Some people have never watched the movie Rosewood or Roots or Django, and they think that's all just fabrication of Hollywood. They don't know the half of it. Like I enjoy Black History Month because yep. it provides some perspective, and not because of the speeches, not because of the memorials, not because yep. oh man. So glad it's Black History Month. Good job, guys. You're black. None yeah. of that shit. Because I get to see the Facebook pictures come up from the history books. The yeah. real documents showing how horrible shit was back in those days of back slavery. Day. And what that yeah. word means to people. A lot of people don't know the word. Oh, like like I say it in, in commonality, like over this podcast or as, as an example, because I, I a lot of people don't use it. And that's okay. I, I don't I don't use it. I don't just walk around like oh hey whatever right. <laughs> uh, that, that's horrible right. But um yep. and 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 the NIGA and Ethiopian background to it and and like Kendrick Lamar breaks it down in one of his videos. Um the the difference between what that means and what the the hard R means like and how essential it is to have understanding. Mm-hmm. You will never catch me. Saying, hey, my nigga, how's it going, man? And no. You know why? Because there's somebody around that's going to be like, huh. Huh. Okay. <laughs> Time to have some Bud Lights. I'm going to say it too. No, bitch. Like, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but, but more than that, that, that shallow level of what I just said, there's a lot that goes into racism, man. There's a yeah. lot. Some people, like I grew up with kids. Like my second podcast guest was was raised to be a racist, and he said, "Fuck you, Dad. You're horrible." When he really realized what racism was, and it broke his heart. Yeah. Like I've I've yeah. I've had great conversations with with neo Nazis and made them change their mind. I've listened to podcasts with great people who who made people lead the Ku Klux Klan. And uh, the most powerful thing you can do as a human being is to stop looking at people through a racial lens. Or, yeah. Sorry, racial lens. And start looking at them as the people that, and as a character. What yeah. are you? And I like I, I listen to you. I don't see a Latino guy. I see a human being who's got a yeah. story. He's got he's got a child. He he powers through tough times in his life, and he's still here today because of it. Yeah, I mean, ain't like speaking of which, like you you kind of just touched up on it, like talking about like cultural differences, like mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, if anybody. If anybody ever, and I say this like jokingly, right? Because it's kind of been brought out a little bit here and there, and a few other podcasts. But like, yo, Latinos be racist as fuck against everybody, including our own selves. Like, yo, you got Puerto Ricans that hate fucking Dominicans. You got Dominicans that hate fucking Cubans. You got Cubans that hate fucking Puerto Ricans. Don't that's get me started. Heart, that's on heartbreaking. That's heartbreaking. It's so bad. It's so well, black. I, I, in my experience. I've seen a, a whole lot of, in my experience, and you know, this experience is different yes. for everybody. I'm not here to yes. judge. I'm just here to share mine. A lot of black people hate white people with a passion, a fiery passion that mm-hmm. might have nothing to do with who they are. And does, is that going to stop this problem of racism? Fuck no, it's not. Like my family not liking my wife because she's white, is that going to solve racism? Fuck no. The lady in Las Vegas who said, Mind your fucking business when my wife uh, clapped for her when she won a bonus and looked her up and down and, and was rude as shit to her. When I, and I know I'm not dumb. I, I know when you're, you're being a racist fuck. It's not hard to see. 
uh, mm. and and she was treated. My wife didn't experience racism before that. Mm -hmm. My wife wasn't pulled over for walking while white until she went to to Mexico and saw how how she could get. Like, I I I can share my my experiences with other people about mm -hmm. just, like racism I've experienced. It's not really going to do the world a service, but um, until you until you've been there, you don't know. It's real. There's people out there who don't like you because of your skin color. It's horrible. I mean, if I, it's man, I, if I Voldemort, if I beard, Voldemort and Harry Potter is a good example, right? Like he hates, yeah. he hates the 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 half bloods or the Muggles, right? The Muggles, and, and that's a way of teaching kids to love one another based off of who you are, not not. You don't, Where you don't you need from, to like, whatever, like yeah. I don't, I don't like, I don't hate you because your skin color, brother. Like you have a dick and balls. You're a man. You're my brother. Okay, woman, sister. It's pretty simple. We don't need to hate each mm -hmm. other because of our skin colors. It's not that hard. Um, yeah. A lot of people never got that talking to when they were a kid and they grew up being a little bitch who's racist, right? But it, it is what it is. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's just... And, like, even, like, you, even if... Because uh, it happened... Oh, man, it happened when... So we over here, we have a buyer. It's what we call it. And think of it like it's like your Kroger. It's like your Walmart. It's like your uh your so your uh, local store your local store yeah yeah like, like a qfc or a, or a safe yeah okay or Publix. Yeah. yeah um so i like fast forward like i'm out I, it's already been like a year or whatever year and a half i grew out my beard i grew out my hair and when it when i get tan like yo i like i could either look like i'm straight from the islands or if i have my facial hair and my hair grown out I literally look like I, I came from the Middle East. Okay. And oh god. I'll never forget this fucking lady, this old bitch. I'm sorry. Wow. Yeah, no, but no, she, be honest, man. I'm I'm she like, fucking, it hurts it hurts me that you that you that you've hurt so much from this that you're remember her like that. It's tough. She had the fucking box Karen cut. She had her and she looked like she just got done from like a little like Sunday church thing. She mm -hmm. she had a nice dress on and everything. She looked like a like a genuine. She just got done praising Jesus. Praising Jesus. I'm happy. For not her. for these not for these brown people. Clearly, oh, God. She like had this fucking mean mug, and she looked me up and down, and then she like kind of like followed me for the like the other like two two three hours, and like where I grew up, inner city like. You had to kind of look 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 behind your back. Yeah. Oh hell yeah, you do. Gangs. Yo, you're always gonna get jumped. Dude, Somebody's gangs. gonna try to jump you for your Somebody shit. Somebody could try Watch. to steal Dude. your sister. What? Like me, for me, it was my sister. Like I have, I have a little baby sister. I'm going to the mini mart with her. I need to make sure that no one's following us, trying to to apprehend her. Traffic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, so I catch her, kind of like just follow me. Like she she ain't, and like she. I, I go to like aisles where I'm like she has no business coming in here, right? Like, I go to like I try to go through like the men's men's uh men's aisle for like deodorant and all that shit. Mm -hmm. She's in there. I'm like, all right, well maybe she has something for like her husband or whatever. But she ain't picked nothing. Go around the next aisle, follows me around so she's there. Just trailing like, you, the and, and you it, it's I'm not hard to know when you're being trailed either. Like, it's not that hard. No, I'm like yo, get the fuck out of here. Like, so. I ended up losing her or whatever, but like it just fucking rubbed me the wrong way. I get back to my car and everything, and I'm just like, like what the like what the fuck? Like what the fucking fuck? What fucks me up is I feel because, and it's even more so now that I, like I joined the infantry. Um, it's I feel like I'm tolerated now. I with without the military background without that veteran status if i have all my tattoos and everything i'm just some other fucking latino dude that could be potentially gang related and i do drugs just general stereotype but it's could the fact that like i have that, that to where you feel like that way yeah but the fact mm -hmm. that i have that veteran status attached is that i feel that i am tolerated i'm 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 tolerated because and it goes back to like how I mentioned it with uh, that one guy in the diner. I'm not, I'm not them. I'm not the bad. I'm not them bad Latinos. He's one of them good Latinos. I see what you're saying. Going that's the military, disgusting, man. You shouldn't feel like fucking, that. That sucks. It it fucking it rubs me the wrong way, but it's like it is the, the way the way that the world is, and like it fucking hurts because like 
my kid is fucking brown. Like he's he has darker complexion than me, honestly. And he's out of like I'm just hoping that the next generation of parents, you know, the parents that 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 are doing this shit with me, that they like, yo, we have to break it. We have to break that fucking generational cycle of of, of racism. Like, yo, and like hate, old, my kids gonna just fuck, hatred in general. My kids man. gonna be yeah. exposed to this, and it's kind of, it's fucked up, man. And how do you like how do? Because all my dad did was tell me, like, you know what? They envy you of your skin, but, like, don't take it to heart, this, this, and that. Like, you know, they want your hair. They want your skin. That's why they apply that fake tan. That's why they try to copy the hairstyles and shit and this, this, and that. That's why they try to open up all these fucking Hispanic places, try to copy our foods and everything. And... I can't, like, I feel like I can't say that to my kid if you were to experience it. If anything, I'm just going to be like, hey, man, just don't take, don't take it to heart. They're just grew up in a house full of hate. That's it. Don't worry about it. Jesus Christ, man. And is that going to be enough to that explain that to, to, to my kid when he experiences it and he asks me? Like, yeah, that's tough, man. I don't want to get all emotional and shit. Jesus Christ, I uh, <laughs> I gotta be honest. But man, it's... Uh, I never I never thought about it like that. Like we are we are obviously I'm about to have children. Um, my my wife is really big on the fact that we've experienced like she knows I've experienced racism in my life and it, it's bothered me. It's bothered me, but I deal with it in in the best way I can, which is mm-hmm. being open about it and slowly opening up and talking to people about it, so I don't yeah uh, carry hatred in my heart based off of the hatred I've received. And you talked about people growing up with hatred in their in their in their hearts. I think it's uh there's never an easy way to talk to children. I've had explained to my wife's little brother um, why it doesn't matter what designs he wants in his hair, even though he's yeah. white, it's, it's okay. You can wear whatever design you want in your hair and it doesn't matter what people say. And yeah. people, people say, well you're trying to be black to him, shit like that. And it, it's disgusting to me. It's disgusting to me because you know what? Being black is fucking beautiful. Being yeah. white is beautiful. Being Latino is beautiful. Being Asian, uh, Pacific Islander, like Hawaii, I, I, all of it's beautiful. We are, you know, we're humans and, and we're human beings and we're imperfect. And that mm-hmm. that imperfection is what creates individuality in all of us. It would be a shame if I was just like every black person or every black and white person because I'm half white. It would be a mm-hmm. shame if I didn't, if I didn't know where my culture came from, the Shaka Zulu tribe, direct descendant, if I didn't know that yeah. on my black side, it would be a shame if I, it would be a shame if I thought uh, that a, a joke about chucking spears for, uh, because I'm black is funny in, yeah. in p- running track and javel- and, and throwing javelin far there than most white guys did. It would be a shame if I ran fast and somebody called it slave feet. It, yeah, it would be a shame. Like regardless what? of what regardless what? of what longest yard <laughs> movies out there, right? And some of the, oh, that's got some slave feet. Like we make jokes, we make these jokes, and 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 can they be funny? Yes, you know, comedy is great, but in in real life, when you're when you're facing this actual, uh, dis disgusting act of of degrading you as a human being based off your skin color, your your yeah. orientation, who the fuck you love, like all these things, or race, religion, these things that are supposed to make us like divided, like. I don't mm-hmm. like these boxes people put it, each other into, but mm-hmm. so I'll be damned if I get put into a box and I'll be damned if my child gets put in a box. Like, Oh yeah. Mm. We're going to call you light skin for now on. Cause your your dad's have black and white and then your mom's white. So you're like, you're not even black at all. Like shut the fuck up. You know, my, my kid's probably going to yeah. punch you in the face because yeah. you know, it's important yeah. to stand up against violence. It's, it's important to stand up against uh, these walls of hatred. And I've had a lot of teachers, and parents try to lecture me on uh, violence over over hatred. And this hatred so violence. And you know what? Violence solves hatred a lot of times. And and uh, it's not it's not about the guns. It's about being oh, honest yeah. and open. And it's about communication. The message you give, punching somebody in the face once and telling them, "Hey, the reason you're lying here on the ground and you just woke up from your knockout from me is because uh, blah blah blah." And it's gonna happen again if you continue to harm other people's souls and make them feel like exactly. they have a place in this earth because we exactly. all we all have a place in this earth and um i'm sorry you've you've you felt these feelings man it uh it breaks my heart that you have to worry about your son or, or your daughter in the future and 
it's so great that you're you're having these conscious thoughts as a father that you want them to not feel what you feel. There's not I don't think yeah. there's enough parents in the world that really say I'm not going to allow my children to feel the same way I felt when my dad told me this or my mom told me this. Mm. And, um, I just want to commend you on that, man. Um, so you're now in the in the Army National Guard, correct? Yep. Yep. And it's been a great experience as far as leadership. So far. And, and, and so far. And, <laughs> and things are changed. Uh, what is it like going as a vet back into the military? Um, so being in the National Guard just allows to fill that void. Um, transitioning out of the Navy to civilian side, right? I did four years Navy, four years civilian. Um fucking terrible choices and we we can talk about it on a different time <laughs> but yeah, uh yeah we, we can we can cover that i can I'll, I'll write it down and remember we'll talk about that in the in the upcoming yeah. stuff yeah um okay just uh it kind of the the training itself just kind of and i think particularly like the infantry training itself um besides Squad tactics, fire team tactics, fucking room clearing, shooting guns, like, like I said, like taking that leadership role, right, as a team lead, um, your drill sergeants that I, that I looked at, that were that I I put, um, as you know, like my mentor for the cycle to like help me get to where I need to be, and to help me, you know, help my team. Um, it, it just filled that, that void that I had when I left. Um, do I think about going to duty? Yeah, absolutely. Even with like my kid and everything, like I still, um, it's a son better. I don't know if I mentioned that, but yeah, like my, my boy, uh, oh, I, yeah, I Facebook stalked you. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, yeah. Like, uh, I still think about it, about going active duty. National Guard for any of my vets looking to like get back into it. Um, it really is just like it, it helps fill that void a little bit. Now I haven't gone to my unit yet, right? I'm supposed to report there on the on the I think next Friday. Uh but um as of right now, it just I feel a little bit more complete. You feel um, grounded, like kind of kind of thing? Definitely. Yeah. Absolutely definitely more grounded what uh because how i left six months well now eight months seven months ago uh when i left back in what was that march to when i came back in august um how i left in march is not the same person absolutely when i came back um yeah just I would, I would recommend it to any vet who just feels like they really do feel lost no matter, even if they got a great job and everything. And like, you, you just feel like, life, just, you know, that you just have a, that a great boy. home and stuff like that doesn't really always feel like a, a, like a need that we have, that we, we can develop this need for com not just camaraderie, but for yeah. purpose. A lot of people leave yeah. the military. We don't know our fucking purpose. And yeah. that, that, I think that is a, and I I know that we can get into a, uh, we can talk about mental health at a different time. I don't want to get too deep into it because yeah, obviously yeah, yeah. like this is uh, obviously your active duty, uh, in or you're you're in a military uh status right yeah, now. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm all about, but but obviously you've had friends and I've had friends that didn't transition out of the military well. And they needed something to come back to 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 give them that sense of family purpose. But they weren't getting at home when they came home, and a lot yeah. of people don't come home all the way, and they're not ready to come home. And it's okay. It's okay to not be ready to come home. It's it's not easy for for the friend I talked to last week to come home and 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 be scared of his own children in the in the room, thinking that they're going to shoot at him because he had kids with uh, AKs shooting at him, and he had to end their lives overseas. Uh, it's okay. Uh, it's okay to 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 be open and honest. And like my heart goes out to vets who are super into combat and vets who weren't. Everybody yeah. has their own struggles, man. And um. You know that's a that's a good message that that the National Guard. Um, it's an option, and it, it is an option. Yeah, it, it's just something if you really truly are just trying to find yourself to get us get get yourself grounded back back mm -hmm. on your feet essentially. Absolutely. Um, 
like speaking of transition like yeah because like when you leave the navy or when you leave your, your your unit for good and like you transition out like civilians are just not they're just not the same like i don't like they're just not they don't they don't know the value of time they don't know the value of time they don't know like when you go back to work at your civilian job and everything like they don't it's just not the same the atmosphere is not the same uh you're only there literally for a paycheck versus like when you're in you're there it doesn't matter how long the fuck you're there you're like suffering together essentially right so you have that bonding you know um even the friends like the friends that uh i made when i was in the military right like uh, for life. camaraderie for life camaraderie yeah camaraderie through shared experiences essentially trying to build that same level of connection with somebody outside while not impossible it's still kind of hard because you're you're there's always going to be like something missing in a way um they're not going to relate everything to you you're not going to relate everything to them you always like share experiences and learn more as a person but i've i've had difficulty since i left like even maintaining friendships even investing i should say investing in friendships that's that's the big one cuz when you're in you really don't like yeah you do need to still work on on your buddies and everything but like it was just so much easier to just get out of your barracks room go across or go down the hall and just knock on the door and just be like yo bro what's up you haven't been doing this lately i just want to check in on you yeah, um and i think we all have we are you you got it just right man we're all tied together based off of this thing and it is uh this this call to service and yeah. i would say we all do make sacrifices but the the real sacrifice a lot of times from my past experience is it's fell on the in the laps of the family uh the people yeah the people who turn into gold star families the people who lose their their service members their yeah. family sacrifices and and sometimes not uh sometimes sometimes the person gives up their whole life just to go to the military and they never come home. Yep. So they, they sacrifice on their own. But um, I, I definitely agree with you, man. It is hard to, to establish relationship and maintain them. I have a difficult time with my friends uh, watching them be bad people. It, it crushes me. I don't want a bad person on my team. And I, I look at that in, in an extreme form compared to normal civilians. But to me, yep. if you're not down, if you ain't loyal to me, if you ain't loyal to your woman, if you ain't loyal to your guy, like I don't fucking trust you, and I have, and I, not yeah. because I have trust issues, it's because I have high standards, and I should have high standards. I wouldn't mm-hmm. trust anybody who isn't. If you enter my home and you're not willing to to shoot, if if there's an act, if there's like a a person who's shooting outside my house at my house, I expect you to either grab a gun for my what I hand you, uh, or 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 yeah. pull your gun out yeah. and shoot this motherfucker who's trying to harm me. And if yep. you're not really capable of of being in a team environment of, at a base level of saying it's okay come here and hold down my dog while there's bullets flying through the front or and that's an extreme way of saying it but if you're not really yeah. to ride for me i can't ride for you man yeah exactly and it, it, it's and it's tough it's tough because civilians don't think like that they they oh my friends are always going to be here they take a lot of things for granted uh what you go to the military all that friends are not the window. Gonna... dude i would man back when i was deployed i'll tell you what i would snap off one of my like every single one of my fingers i'd break them all with my left hand and then have you break the my left hand fingers one by one just to be in my wife's presence for 10 minutes and just to hear her laugh when i was deployed a lot of people don't have that desperation that that need for um for love or for yeah. another human being to be around you i missed my my sister to the point where i would cry and i still cry every time i hear the song butterfly kisses it's not yeah. it's, nothing's <laughs> changing man but um you're you're absolutely right these it's different Tra- transitioning out of the military is hard and uh that's what a, a big part of my uh the the new ventures i'm working on with this podcast is talking about yeah. transitioning out of the military and it's super tough and um god there's not enough words to say that there's i'm gonna obviously pour resources um yeah like i always yeah. do on the facebook page when i release this about mental health and 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 if anything if you listen to this and you're you're struggling 
just reach out to me, man. I'd love to chat with you. I have, I'm injured out of work and I got nothing better to do than, than to talk to people about their struggles. But, um, absolutely. I, like so fucking a dude. I wish I could put in words how important it is what you said. It's difficult to transition. And, uh, I thank you for sharing, for taking the time out of your day and, and sharing it with me. I know you have a child. Uh, it's great for a, a father to, to be there present in their child's life. You, we waited till your kid was asleep for this. And I, I really do appreciate you taking the time out of your day all the way from a different time zone uh, yeah, and time travel to man. be here. So thank you so much. Absolutely, brother. No worries, man. If anything, I, like like you said, like I just want to be able to share my experiences best way I can. If there's somebody who is going through something similar, like, like hey, I'm still here. It's possible. There's always There's always a light. You just gotta be able to ultimately still do the work for it. Just there's always hope. Just keep for the hope. Yeah. And don't and don't ever give up. Well, I, I do appreciate you joining me together, uh, you know, to come together and make this happen, man. All right, much love, buddy. All right, brother. You have a going, man. We spent a lot of time on this podcast talking about mental health, but I want to talk about physical health for a second. There's nothing more uplifting and confidence boosting than looking in the mirror and seeing exactly what you want looking back at you. The person I trust to make sure that's happening, no matter if I'm going through an injury or not, is Brian Click. He's my friend, mentor, coach, and now one of our sponsors here at Off the Deep End. Head over to the link in the description and check out why I choose him. All over his Instagram and his website, you will be seeing the different clients who have worked with him in the past, whether it's bodybuilding or just maintaining a healthy lifestyle or working towards a certain goal in a sport and making sure you make weight. Brian is a guy I trust for every single different category and facet that fitness surrounds. There's nothing more important than liking what you see in the mirror and liking how you feel when you wake up every day. So head over to his website and get this process started. Mm -hmm.